Welcome everyone. Talk for um, thank you. My, 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 my biggest fan. Um, so who can tell me the theme of the retreat? Always forward. Always forward. Always forward. Yes. I put it up here for a reason. Make sure you're paying attention. We've been talking this weekend about always moving forward. Always moving forward. It's been on the board, it's been on the program, it's been shirts tomorrow. You can't skip that. Um, but I do find that sometimes that the retreat atmosphere that we have is a bit disingenuous, a bit dishonest, and doesn't really do you guys as much good as we would hope it would. What do I, what do I mean by this? Many of you are like giving wide eyes right now. It's like, whoa, you said we're on a Christian retreat. We can't say these things. Well, go. Buckle up. Um, being a Christian is hard. Full stop. There's no but in this. In this being a Christian is hard. It is a matter of fact, it is going to be one of the hardest things that you're ever going to do if you do it well. And to be even more honest, sometimes it's going to kind of suck. <laughs> and once again, I get wide eyes. I hate you. I can't say these things. Yes, I can. Because it's the truth. There are going to be times like this when we're on retreat. And I know some of you have been on retreats before. And typically the final talk of the retreat is the one where we pull out the, the analogy of being up on a mountain away from the world. And we're on this high. And we're, we feel all the feels on retreat. And then we descend back into the valley of the real world. And we hit that low and we like lose that retreat high. That's really the final talk. But I'm stealing it in this retreat for the fourth talk. So Elizabeth had to rewrite hers. Um, and she was very upset about it. Uh, but I got to deliver my talk first. So take that. Um, it's like, but oftentimes we feel all the big, happy, high feelings of getting jazzed up because we sing a lot of songs, we, we dance, we, we pump you guys full of sugar. And we play silly games, some of us dress and drag. Um, <laughs> and like we get you guys all pumped up. And then you you may have like a really profound experience with God. And that is wonderful. And to be honest, I kind of hope you do. But then we return home and we don't feel that way anymore. And we feel as though, oh, it's because something's wrong with. There's something bad. I am bad. And how could God love me? And that is the lie that I would like to dispel this evening. Because there are going to be times when you're just not going to be about it. You're not going to be feeling it anymore, Mr. Krabs. It's just, it's just not... You're, it, it, the, the time will pass, and you will look into yourself and go, is there something wrong with me? And the reason I know this is because it happened to me. I was sitting in your shoes. Well, 13 years ago. Um, it's been a while. I'm old. Um, but like my senior year, I went on a retreat. I had a fantastic time. Big, earth-shattering experience. Another one again, the summer trip. Great, awesome. Went to college. Went to NC State. Go back. Um, check it, check your reflexes. Um, went to NC State my freshman year. I was involved with everything. <laughs> Catholic Campus Ministries didn't know what to do with me. I went to, I went to every event. I was there. Me and my friends. Brought it all. We were the hoodlums <laughs> that took over. Because the next year, when we were all sophomores instead of freshmen, we actually did take over. Like, the whole leadership team was just me and my friends. Uh, with, like, a, like, a handful of holdovers from the old regime. And we took over. And I was a spiritual life coordinator, uh, which means that like all of like the formation, prayer groups, small groups, Bible studies, walk in the rosary, retreats, anything that had to do with spiritual life at Catholic Campus Ministries at NC State was me for two years. I had a two-year term, uh, back to back, but my uh, sophomore and junior year of college. And by the end of that time, I was incredibly jaded, 
I was cynical. I was not about it anymore. I couldn't separate my work from my faith and prayer life. And I just didn't, wasn't about the whole Jesus thing anymore. And like I, after that, after that two-year term, I kind of just cut ties uh, with uh, Catholic Campus Marriage of the State. Like I still went to mass like, on a regular basis because I'm transitioned from a I'm on fire for Jesus uh, part of my life to a boy I really hope I don't get hit by a bus and go to hell uh, portion of my life. Even though it would pay for my college tuition. Um, <laughs> I. I it scared me. So I went to mass on a regular basis. And I went to confession on a regular basis. Once again, out of fear. Got hit by a bus, didn't want to go down. Um, but that's not, that wasn't a healthy, yeah, Jesus part of my life. It was a, uh, please don't spite me part of my life. I was checking the boxes, going through the motions, doing the bare minimum. And that part of my life lasted for a few years. Um, and, uh, many of you may not know this, but like between graduating from NC State and then starting my professional career, um, I lived at home for a year. Went back to good old Hickory, North Carolina. There's, there's no, there's no O in that order. It's just Hickory. People that say Hickory are pronouncing it wrong. Um, good old Hickory, North Carolina. Moved home. And I will look back on that year that I lived at home with my parents, very fun, and not because it was rainbows and butterflies, because let me tell you, once you taste that sweet, sweet freedom of being on your own and having your apartment and then moving back in with your parents, things are not all sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> like, there was a lot of adjustments, there was a lot of hard times that went on, but there were, uh, this was a time in my life where there were some great people and uh, some great communities and some great changes that happened in my life. And a lot of it had to do with these schmucks. Um, so so the, the tall one with the glasses that's standing next to me, that's my best friend, that's Rob. And then the really short one over here, <laughs> that's, that's Billy. Uh, these two guys are incredibly um, important to me, especially during this time in my life. Uh, they lived in Hickory, North Carolina. Some of my best friends. Rob was actually the best man at my wedding, and Billy was there too. Um, <laughs> really? No, we did not do that. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, it was through the uh, conversations that, that we had, the projects that we worked on, the, like, the, the, the real talk that we had, um, that, I was able to transition from a, oh, please don't smite me. I don't want to go to hell if I get hit by a bus, um, to actually having my hope in Christ again. And what does that mean? We, we talk about putting our, putting our hope in Christ and putting our hope in God all the time. And we do uh, oftentimes a really terrible job at explaining on what that stuff means. Um, so I'm going to walk you through it. Um, putting our hope in Christ is putting our trust in what he says that he's actually going to deliver. Because Christ has made some promises. He's made some big promises. And we believe, if we put our hope in him, we believe that he's going to deliver on those promises, which is great. Um, it's not going to make the, the times where we feel down about ourselves go away, but it will give us strength to hopefully move forward and go through them. Because Jesus is an incredibly understanding God. He knows. If I had to ask you right now, and I am going to ask you right now, what's the symbol? Well, if I had to ask you what the symbol of Christianity is, what would you say? The crucifix, right? A 
torture implement. A man dying on the worst torture implement ever devised is the symbol of our religion. Did you ever wonder about that? Yes. It's like, why? We have so many symbols in, in Christianity. We could go with something way nicer. We could go with this. We could go, <laughs> we could go with Buddy Christ. Look at him. Look, look at this man. Look how happy he looks. Look, like, look how reassuring that wink is. Like, this is, this is the man that's like, you got this. You, you can do this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, and, and regardless of if you win or fail, like, we'll, we'll go have a couple of drinks after. Like this is this, this is the this is the this is the nice. We could have had this. We could have had the, the, the say cart. We could have had the the dove of the Holy Spirit. We could have had that fish thing that you see on the back of cars. Like we it's called an ichthus, by the way. It's Greek, um, but like none of those symbols have the clout that the crucifix. Cross has. Why? Why? It's because we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded of Christ's passion. Because in those times where being a Christian kind of sucks, we can look and go, well, yeah, obviously, look at the example that we have before us. Have you seen our symbol? <laughs> of course it sucks. Like, look, look at the passion. The passion starts in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? We read in the Gospels, the Garden of Gethsemane. What happens in the Garden of Gethsemane? What does Jesus do? He struggles. He is on the struggle bus. Three times, three times, Jesus asks, hey, can we not? Can we maybe just do literally anything else other than me suffering and dying for everybody? Like, I, I would really like to go home, please. Jesus did that. The all-powerful creator of the universe had doubts and anxiety and fears about the future. To the point where he was so anxious and stressed out that he started to sweat blood. So when you have those feelings, know that Jesus is like, that man's saying, uh, <laughs> I get it. He knows. And it's difficult sometimes for us to think about that, but we're constantly reminded every time we go into a Catholic church, he's saying up there, we're giving us a reminder. But it would be a poor symbol if it was just to remind us that, hey, this is going to suck. Because that's not where the story ends. Because we keep reading in the Passion story. So Jesus goes from the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes, he goes up on trial. They whip him. They, they take him to the cross. And it's on the cross that he goes to war. He goes to war with sin and death through his son. And he wins! He comes in and RKO's him out of nowhere. Just total victory. Comes in, lays the smack down, and then comes back three days later with, with a swagger in his step, show, like, showing off the wounds in his arms and side. And he's like, look at these cool battle scars that I got in the war that I just won. Come join me, and you can share in my victory the promise that Christ has made. The big promise. He has come and he said that you too can taste ultimate victory over sin and death if you follow him. And he does it, he does it one better. Because oftentimes we're like, oh, that sounds really hard. And it is. Obviously, Jesus. Jesus didn't look like he was having fun up on the cross. Like, it's hard. It's like, and it's like, maybe you don't feel like it. Well, obviously, Jesus didn't feel like it either. He asked three times to get out of it and got a resounding no from God. Like, why do we ever think that we're going to be any better than him at this? Like, 
But on top of all of that, Jesus not only says, follow me, he says, let me be your strength. Let me be the one to do it. Let me be the one to work through you. He promises that he, the man who does nothing but win, will be on your team and pull you through it if you but let him call the shots. If you but let him make the plays in your life. In those times where you feel weak or those times that you're not feeling about it, it doesn't matter. Because you don't have to feel strong. Christ is strong. You don't have to be all about it. Christ is about it. He is about you. Christ loves you. And he will do anything for you if you but let him. We have an opportunity this evening to be in the presence of Christ yet again in adoration. This one's going to be a little, little bit longer. Um, it's going to be where we've primed you guys throughout the retreat. Uh, I hope you are looking forward to this time. And when I said that Christ would do anything for you, like I, I want to stress this. Like, he wanted, he will do so much for you that he, the all-powerful creator of the universe, will humble himself and become bread. He'll, he'll, he will be a piece of bread for you. <laughs> like, that is how badly he wants to work in your life. He could not stand to be away from us. So he set up the institution of the Eucharist so that he could be in our lives. Real, physically present in our lives. So take these moments. Take this moment tonight. Take this moment to bring your weakness, your doubts, your anxieties. Like anything that we burned this morning, like if it is still with you, take it to him. Let it, let, take it in front of him and go, Jesus, you handle this. You promised. Deliver. And he will. Now, he might not do it on your time. He might not do it in the way that you like. But he'll do it the best way. Because he's a man that always wins. <laughs> so, do not let these times pass you by. Do not stay in the moments where things kind of suck. Always move forward. See, this would have been really cool if her slides opened up there. And I just, but I, but I, didn't, I didn't plan it like that. That was, that was about, always move forward. <laughs> and always be victorious. Because Jesus always did.